Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives, and this is another in our series of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. If we can't get out into the workplace for job shadowing or internship experiences, and we can't right now when we're recording this due to the shelter in place, we want to bring a variety of occupations and career pathways to you as part of your learning. So today we're lucky. This is again part of a series of interviews we're doing with uh, uh, people who work for the city of St. Charles. Government represents one of the biggest sectors of um, the workplace. I, for example, work for the government and have uh, for most of my career. And so today we're here with Steve. Steve, I'm going to turn it over and let you introduce your super interesting and incredibly important job. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve O'Neill. I'm a wastewater operator for the city of St. Charles. Um, I've also worked in the laboratory as well. Um, I've been doing this for approximately, well, about 20 years now. So tell us what a wastewater operator does. What does that mean? Well, that's, I can demystify this. The, um, the interesting part is so many people don't know where it goes when we flush the toilet, run the mm -hmm. sink, and whatnot. And up until about 20 years ago, I did not either. Um, a wastewater operator is a dynamic position. You're not stuck at a desk all day, that is for sure. Um, you need desk time, there's always learning, there's always paperwork, but wastewater itself, starting over 100 years ago at this point, um, was one of the best modern inventions for the health and safety of society and the environment for that matter, and along with clean water. We would not have what we have today as a first world country without such things. But the task of taking care of what we flush and maintaining the environment and the health and safety of people is my job. And what I do on a day to day basis is extremely dynamic. Um, anywhere from knowing the biology of what we have going here, because this is a largely chemical free process, we let the mm -hmm. bugs do the work. And there's also chemical aspects to it, too, and regulatory where we have to abide by certain restrictions and um, laws on what we put into the uh, waterways and for that matter onto fields because we land apply our biosolids. But my job from a day-to-day -day perspective can be anything from handling and dewatering sludge, which I can describe what that is, um, checking pumps, checking blowers, checking the health of bugs, um, which I call bugs in terms of our bacterial population. We have to keep them happy. Um, to taking samples for analysis and running analysis for that matter. Um, you have to truly have a lot of mechanical aptitude, but an understanding of how nature works. And that's where schooling comes in for that matter. So, so that's awesome. Uh, I mean, there's so much to talk about here there's in terms lot, of yeah. in terms of your occupation. But let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Walk us through what happens. And you know, the sink is like interesting, right? But it, come on, it's the toilet that people want to know about. So when someone flushes the toilet, yep. if if I lived in St. Charles or if I'm yep. in a business in St. Charles and I flush the toilet what happens from there to the water? Good question. Um, depending on where you're at, it can, when you flush a toilet, it goes through a series of pipes, miles of pipes potentially, and potentially to what we call lift stations that actually convey the wastewater to us by via pumps. So not everything can roll downhill, if you will. And those are things we take care of here. We have 16 lift stations um, that give us a variety of headaches and we need to maintain them in all operational conditions or else your, what you flush may come back to you, mm -hmm. um, it, unfortunately. We have a department for that also. But when it travels to the lift stations, pumps to us and comes into our wastewater treatment plant, we have a variety of tanks and equipment that separate solids and water some are called primary uh, clarifiers, goes to big basins, which we call mixed liquor, that actually the active bacteria stabilizes um, the carbon-based forms of the wastewater itself and treats it. And we try and hold on to the solids as much as possible. 
we try and get rid of the water element of it. So we separate the water and the solids. We disinfect and send out to the river um, via a pipe that leads into our main waterway, which in this case is the Fox mm -hmm. River. And what happens inside of that is a lot of looping around and pumping where after the bugs take care of it, we separate those solids. We actually have to handle the solids also. And those stay in here longer. We stabilize those further and we put them through a dewatering process, um, which further stabilizes, it concentrates the solids and makes it into a very organically rich, um, basically manure, if you will, mm -hmm. which we then we try to land apply because it's cost prohibitive to landfill bio mm -hmm. solids. When we do land apply those things, farmers love it. It bio augments their crops and they can grow number uh, feed crops, no direct mm -hmm. human consumption type crops. And there's many different levels of bio solids where I could, in essence, put it in your garden if it met the right regulations mm -hmm. and, and test. So, but at that, at that point, the amount of things that occur here from when you flush the toilet could be just a day mm -hmm. that that substance is here, or it could be up to a few months. So it's constantly in motion. That's the, that's the one thing that wastewater doesn't stop. You don't want your water to stop your electricity to go out. Mm -hmm. Your toilets have to flush. And it is a very constant operation, which now we incorporate a lot of technology into that with telemetry observation where we can observe even when we're not here, good alarm systems and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so. so, so tell us about how you, how you ended up in this role. Like you left high school and then <laughs> what happened next? Like in terms of training and education decisions sure. you made that, that led you from there to here educationally. Right turns and wrong turns. No, um, I actually went to this, uh, St. Charles high school, um, and I attended Eastern Illinois University when I graduated from there. And I always had an aptitude um, for biology and the pathways in the environment and connecting them. Um, I compliment Bonnie Redmer for that, my biology AP bio teacher, who was an excellent teacher. Um, I didn't really have a direction, but I felt that there was something I found interesting and would be a non-traditional job. Um, I'm not one to sit. This will be the most I've sat today, and I don't mm -hmm. like sitting. But mm -hmm. when I, the sophomore year, I believe I declared for biology, environmental biology to be more specific, humans and in interaction with the environment. And uh, at the end of four years, well, during that time, actually, we all do summer jobs, and internships are much more common nowadays. I ended up getting a summer job here, and I liked it. I liked it very much. I thought the, the position itself was exciting, is dynamic. You never know what's going to pop up and quite literally and after that i parlayed that into an internship in the laboratory um i've never been a gigantic lab guy but i found what we were doing to be able to test something have an outcome and apply it towards a large scale almost industrial operation if you will like this and have an effect it was it was very interesting and it was local um, mm -hmm. which is another key aspect of environmentalism on a local focus which i thought was great you know, you might not be able to save the world, but you can help your little corner of it. That's awesome. So after you graduated with your bachelor's degree, did you then end up straight in a job in in the city of St. Charles because of your internship? I did not, but I was diligent at keeping touch with mm -hmm. people here because I felt this was something I might want to do. Um, you could say I was directionless, but I was just, I was a kid. I was a young adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ended up working in a medical diagnostic company for about nine months, I believe. And that was around uh, 2000. And you, diagnostic analysis for hair, um, blood, you mm -hmm. name it, medical companies mm -hmm. telling you if you have heavy metals and whatnot mm -hmm. like that. And that was local too. It just, it was too confining. Mm -hmm. um, there were no windows mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't truly really enjoy so um i waited and, and again touched base with people around here and found an opening and was able to get in um 19 years ago full-time july so cool yeah. cool yeah. that's awesome that is that is a great story and um 
I think one of the things that's important here is we know that that this kind of work is important across all all classes, the whole school day, and you calling out, giving a shout out there to your AP bio teachers, I think a reason why, while there's a lot of curriculum that needs to be covered in advanced placement or dual credit class, making time to expose students to these kinds of experiences is actually also really important in those classes. Because, and the, it's funny, the way you described what you like about the lab work you do now is you're taking that and then putting it right into action. Um, yep. That's the research I like is is the exact same thing. I mean, different topics, but exact same thing. I get the scientific super, method. Yeah, yeah, I get super motivated by by it if we're going to apply it directly to students yeah. real quickly, and we're going to turn something around because of that. So um, that's fantastic. So what what would be the most surprising part of your job to those of us that that don't do your work? It's something I may have touched on before. Is the the biological aspect of this. Most people see large tanks and um, bubbling substances, and they think that there's some sort of high-tech chemical process involved here, which there is, but it's on a biological scale. And I, when I tell them, up until a year ago, we were 100% chemical free, minus a biodegradable polymer that we use to coagulate, sorry, coagulate our solids together, mm -hmm. bunch them together. Um, and they're always surprised at that. I tell them this is these are all bugs and we're just shepherds of the bugs. And that still holds true. Um, we try and keep these bugs happy, but we try and kill those bugs going out the door to make it mm -hmm. safe for, uh, for the health of the environment and yourselves. So it's mm -hmm. things such as E. coli and whatnot. We use ultraviolet disinfection as opposed to chlorine, which uh, can be harmful to the environment. So that's that. Yeah. They're always fascinated by that. Yeah, and it is fascinating. I mean, I I remember exactly where I was when I first learned that. I was between Bloomington Normal and Peoria on I-74 going to yeah. a bike race. What One of my college roommates was, uh, everybody had a nickname. We were all bike racers living in this apartment together. And the doctor was an environmental biology grad student at the time and uh, studied exactly what you do. And as we drove past the rest area, and saw the the greenish colored water next to the rest area, he explained to us what was going on. And everybody was like, oh yeah, yeah, we knew that. And I, I had no clue. I was fascinated and I don't think anybody else knew it either. Um, but yeah. I was shocked because I assumed someone was dumping chemicals in there ah. to treat it. And when he explained, no, 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 that's not how this works. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. So- um, Wonderful technology as well that Every technology builds upon the previous invention, mm -hmm. and it it's amazing to see that that movement of technology, even in a field like this, that that betters the treatment, that betters the cost savings and whatnot. Mm -hmm. A lot of energy conservation too in this field nowadays. That's that's awesome, and especially you you know you referenced earlier in this conversation that, you know, in the United States, we've got some resources that not all parts of the world have in terms of financial resources and wanting everybody to be able to benefit from A, the environmental benefits and, and B, the health benefits or vice versa, but both They're of them. Commingled. Yeah, yeah yep. exactly. Um, those kind of efficiencies, creating those efficiencies will make it easier, I would imagine, to deploy these kinds of solutions everywhere that that people yes, live yeah the um there's a package plant aspect nowadays for smaller scale thinking globally to mm -hmm. communities that may not have um connection to the grid and whatnot you can put smaller scale wastewater treatment plants in um that are energized by uh renewable energies and they have no connection and but they're getting that benefit locally of clean water and clean sanitation, and it's amazing. So that is being employed throughout the world. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing, sorry. That, that's that's super interesting too. And for students who are watching multiple of these videos, I mean, just a, a couple episodes ago, we interviewed a, uh, a wind farm operator who's, okay. who's background in school, he, he went to school to be a nuclear engineer and, and now he's working in wind energy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, way, I mean, uh -huh. so, well. so I mean, it's super interesting when you think about like his wind farm technology and this clean water technology and how there are places that those that those could be married, including right here in, in Illinois Absolutely. then. Um, yep. So that's super interesting. So what would you say if if someone watched this and they were they were an AP bio student somewhere and 
they're thinking about what they're going to do after high school. What would be the skills or the knowledge that you would tell them are the most important things to learn in the next few years before they enter the workplace full time if they're like jazzed up about hearing what you're doing? To have the big picture, the, the understanding of biology, plain and simple, is important. Connecting the dots, understanding the scientific method and cause and effect. Um, but also, the, there's an aspect of mechanical aptitude that can be learned. Because um, I could be one moment making a process change and the next moment taking apart a pump or pulling mm -hmm. a pump. And I find both of those equally challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and they operate different parts of my brain for that matter. So having a, a well-rounded skill set, not just being proficient in you know, the book aspect of things, but really applying your knowledge to, to worldly things and, and from an environmental standpoint, to know biology truly is, is the most important aspect of that. And everything else can be learned. It's like changing a tire or doing mm -hmm. an oil change. If you've never done it, just try it. You'll save money and it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as the specific skill sets, it's it's difficult to explain because you need a bit of everything. Jack of all, master of none, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. so. so this is the second of the three interviews episodes we're doing in the government series. And that exact phrase has been used in both of them now. And again, <laughs> as someone who has worked in government my whole sure. career, I would describe my, both my favorite parts of the jobs I've had, as well as the, the defining phrases you know, master of master of none, but jack of all, exactly. Yeah. And so so I think that's really important thing, even more broadly than your specific occupation as we start looking at careers in government, um, for students to think about, oh, I might have to do some things that are are beyond just the one thing I think I'm gonna do. Absolutely. And that actually makes it exciting mm -hmm. to do that. You know, yep. I, I was 18 years in a laboratory, I could do that job inside and out. I chose to come over to a oper more operational base here to challenge myself. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you do the same thing, you know, putting the cap on a toothpaste in an assembly line, it's going to get boring, a little monotonous, mm -hmm. you know. And the dynamic aspect, you, you may say, oh, I could do this the rest of my life. But 10 years down the road, you go, I need a different challenge. And the things you've learned along the way, not just in your schooling, but in your applied you know, work years is really what what's going to get you where you want to be. You you're you have a sense of self when you're younger. You start to define that more clearly as you work and progress in life and the changing of the seasons in your life, if you will. Mm -hmm. so. so in all of our jobs, there's things that people either have no idea that we do as part of the work or things that a lot of us that do that work don't like doing but it's part of the job. Is there something about your job that either you or other people in your line of work just typically don't like to do, but people should know about it or that people would have no idea you do? And because we want to give people a full picture of what the job entails. Yes, there are a couple things that not a lot of people truly enjoy doing in our field. And, and, and when you're dealing with a very a raw sludge, a raw sewage that um, very high odor, very high disgusting value, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a small nose, thankfully, and I'm immune to most things nowadays in terms of smell. But there's just you have to operate your shovel. Things spill. Um, dumpsters overflow because uh, in a wastewater treatment process, there are things you don't want in a wastewater treatment plant. So you can only imagine the um, sensory value mm -hmm. that that's going to provide for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, doing dumpsters at our lift stations. We have lift stations that clean and screen um, solids. Mm -hmm. um, people flush very interesting things down the, the toilet or the sink for that matter. And uh, we put those into dumpsters for landfill operation. And sometimes the dumpsters overfill. We have to shovel that up. And it's not very pleasant, but it's a job you have to do. No. That, that is 
Well, that is truly the best answer we've had in like the 15 or so episodes we've done. I and mean, really, anybody else looks at me and says, this part of my job I don't like, I'll be like, I got one better for you now. So yeah, um, yeah no, that's, well, that's a great example. And not only is it a reminder to everybody not to flush that stuff down the toilet that oh shouldn't gosh. be going down the toilet, yeah. um, but interesting to think about that process of how it gets screened out and, and then gets dumped yeah. and taken to the landfill. So, um, technology in that field as well that's it's impressive yeah i'm sure i'm sure and i you know just in my head the connection i make is is i wonder about the overlap between that and like the sorting that happens at recycling plants for example because it's yep. to me it's probably a pretty similar similar set of technologies that are going on there so yeah. i don't really know though um so what what would you say are the job prospects for someone who who's watching this thing oh this could be interesting working in, in this field? I believe the prospects are good. Um, what you find in a, in a government field for that matter, local government included, state government, even federal, is that a lot of people don't just up and quit a job once they get it. They're here generally for long ta- long haul. I mean, mm-hmm. you're looking at 10 years of, when I first started, they said the tenure was at least 11 years in the position um, mm-hmm. for the city as a whole. And the prospects themselves are good because when you looked at when the Clean Water came, Act came out, I believe in 1972, you had a lot of people in the last 15 years uh, term out through retirement. Mm-hmm. And those openings, they're there. You just have to find them. Even locally, they're here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the prospects are very good for that matter, especially when I believe the, the Mike Rose of the world talk about, mm-hmm. you know, there's jobs beyond just a four-year schooling. That, that still basically require that knowledge base, but they're not a cubicle job. And these are those jobs. I love it. Um, I think the future is good. You're going to get some automation in this particular industry, but the more technology and automation that you get, the more oversight is needed. So you're going to need people with computer skills as well. Uh, telemetry, SCADA operations, um, if you're familiar with SCADA. It, it's, it's impressive. So, But I think the future is good. That's a great call. Thanks for tying for tying that in too, because there's certainly not a field that a knowledge of of either hardware or or programming is. Yeah. You know, yeah. those are those are benefits across any field um, to I have agree. have those areas of knowledge. Um, so finishing up, I mean, normally we ask people as our second to last question, what what how does this work make a positive impact on the world? Um, I'll throw that one at you. It feels a little bit like a softball in this interview because I think it's pretty obvious, but super important. So let's not gloss over it. How does this this uh, make a positive impact in the world? In the world itself, which is the amazing part of, of what we do here, is I, I even touched on it earlier, saying we help local populations, but that's just not the case as well. We help global populations because of what we do in wastewater cleaning operations. We end up putting that water into the Fox River that goes mm-hmm. to the Illinois River, that goes to the Mississippi River, that goes to the Gulf of Mexico. That one drop of water that we treat has existed for billions of years and that will make its way around the earth by having that, taking out our our footprint from it, let's say nitrogen, phosphorus, Mm -hmm. E. coli, that can be clean water down the road. Mm -hmm. That can be consumed for human consumption and and utilized for the ecosystem itself, fish, birds, animals Mm -hmm. in general. And that's how we do it, one drop at a time, if you will, here, and 100 years later, it's down in, you know, going through the Arctic, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I, I don't, I try not to look at the bigger picture on things. I I do look at what I do in this smaller aspect, but I know that I have a a larger influence uh, on the world because of what I do in this small little town. Mm -hmm. That's a That's super a- powerful, super powerful and very honest answer. So finishing up then, what words of advice for, for any career they might be interested, but would you give a 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 18-year-old, or 20-year-old who's thinking about what they might want to do? Well, that's actually a, a very easy thing to, to answer, which is never shy away from an opportunity to learn something new. Challenge yourself and be open to ideas on something you may not think you want to do, but you may find it exciting and passionate about it. So that is awesome advice. Um, so thank you. 
thank you so much uh, to for joining us today and and for sharing all this. You you do do as I said at the outset, uh, super important and super interesting work. I uh, you know someday someday when the shelter in place is done, maybe we'll come on site and do a little site visit for this and uh, blow it out a little further. Yep. So that would be wonderful. I'd love to have you. Very cool. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us today. For those of you watching, remember you can connect with us on Twitter at P20Network, that's P20Network, all one word. We do want to hear from you on occupations that would be interesting to hear from. If you know somebody specifically who might be a great guest, please let us know. And if you have questions that you'd like answered across any careers, uh, please share those with us. Again, we've got a wide range of careers available already in the Career Pathways Virtual Trailhead series, literally from Broadway to an electrical outlet and everything in between. And so uh, keep watching. We've got more episodes coming and thanks for joining us.